Greetings, I would like to welcome you to this year's Appointed, Anointed and Accomplished Woman Life Planning Seminar for Young Women. I know that you're going to be very blessed because we have a powerful lineup of speakers. We're going to have our very own mother and founder of this ministry, Pastor June Lutwama. We also have other speakers, powerful women of God. We have Pastor Lucy Desire from Kenya, Pastor Tirinao Lamba from Malawi, and Pastor Angie Moflira, who is based in the UK. So we're going to have two sessions. In the morning, we're going to finish at 11 a.m. Central African time, which is 12 o'clock Eastern African time. And then we're going to take a two hour break uh, and resume at one o'clock, 1 p.m. Central African time, which is two o'clock East African time. So for this morning session, we have two topics. The first one is life planning, and it's going to be taken by Pastor Lucy Desire, who is based in Kenya, as I've already said. She's a very powerful um, trainer. Uh, she's a trainer and she coordinates um, some Bible-based training programs in East Africa. She also um, oversees a program, or let me say a women's ministry called Women of Wonder in Kenya. She's very passionate about empowering women through the word of God, and I know that you're going to be very blessed. And we have uh, a topic on self-esteem that is going to be taken by Pastor Tilinao Lamba. Pastor Tilinao Lamba is a youth intern pastor at World Alive International Ministries in Malawi. She is also a counseling psychologist. She lectures at the University of Malawi. So being a psychologist, I, I believe you can see that it's going to be a very powerful session, uh, taking self-esteem. She's very passionate about mental health. Uh, but before that, we're going to start with worship. We have Pastor Danielle Poulet, who is going to lead us in worship. She's a powerful musician, a very anointed worshiper, based in Kampala, Uganda. And I know that you'll be very blessed as she leads us. So Danielle, I hand it over to you now. Thank you. Yours, Lord. I am glad. Yeah. 
Hello to us all. I am very grateful for this opportunity to minister at the appointed, anointed and accomplished woman conference for this year, Life Planning Seminar. It's such a joy for me to always have the opportunity to just come back and share the word of God with you. Pastor June, I'm so grateful for the privilege and the honor of continually being able to minister on this uh, platform. And I want to say thank you to all the other ministers and the speakers that are joining me in the seminar. I want to thank God for all the viewers that are watching us. We bless God for this opportunity. I know you will not be disappointed. My name is Lucy Desire. I am a mother of two daughters and wife to Pastor Dennis Desire. And I'm really grateful for this opportunity to share with you the word of God today. Um, if I can just go right into the word, I am so excited about this topic of life planning. I generally enjoy planning as an individual. And the greatest thing to realize about planning anything that you do in your life is that it's always something that has an intention, an intended end. And when you look at this life planning situation, it's something that God already has in place for us. Uh, maybe I should not even go ahead of myself. Let's look at just the simple definitions of life planning. And our theme for this year's conference is uh, fearfully and wonderfully made. So this, let's just look at planning. What is planning? Planning is um, in basic definition, I would say it's just in, an intention to do something. A plan is what I intend to do. It can be for my social life, it can be for my career life, it can be for my vocational life, business, school, ministry, uh, it can be for my future, it can be investment. It's just an intention of how you want life to happen for you. Uh, the other definition that I want us to think about is the definition of the word fearfully. In the Hebrew, fearfully is uh, pronounced, uh, the word fearfully uh, is defined as yare, uh, spelled as Y-A-R-E, yare. And yare means to respect, to revere, um, to stand in awe, to, awe, to honor, just that reverence, that is what fearfully means. And then wonderfully, uh, it also has a Hebrew word which means, which uh, is pala. Pala is P-A-L-A. -A. Pala means to be separate, uh, to be special, to be distinguished, to be unique. So when we look at that scripture in Psalms 139, it basically means that we were created with so much reverence, with great reverence, with um, heartfelt interest and uh, the joy of doing it and uh, with so much respect. God, when he was creating us, he intended that we would be unique, would be set apart. He took care of that creation of us. He did it with so much awe. He did it with so much care and that is what it means to be fearfully and wonderfully made. God has put so much thought process to how he has created us. And when he looks at us, we are unique. We are beautiful. Uh, let me remind you that you are the only you that God has ever created and will ever create. Each of us is a masterpiece. Each of us is a creation that cannot be duplicated. You might find you look like your sisters, but there's just that one thing that's, that distinguishes you. Even uh, identical twins, there is always something that distinguishes one from the other because they are fearfully and wonderfully made unique, set apart, different. And that is what God is telling us. Before we were ever formed, before we anything existed, he had already pre-purposed how it will be. It will be beautiful, it will be wonderful. And I want us to think about our lives and the plans that we make. When we talk about life planning, we are planning for our lives consistently. We are going into life, se life, life planning seminars. We are discovering what should we do uh, for us ladies. Maybe you're looking, you're planning for how you take care of your skin, how you take care of your health, how you take care of your career. I mean, you have plans, you've organized, you've, if it's your home, you've had plans that, you know, they're definite. 
And that is the same way God has a plan for you. I personally enjoy gardening. And when I think about gardening, in my mind, when I think about planning, when I think about creating something, when I go into my garden, and for example, like vegetable garden or the flower garden, my idea of doing that farming, that gardening, is the end is always in mind. I begin with the end in mind. For example, the end in mind for me is to see beautiful roses. I'll think about how I want the background to look like, how I want the middle ground to look, how do I want the ground area to be, you know, to look. I mean, when I'm landscaping, my brain is giving me the end in mind. I want the final picture so that when I start the whole process, I will start with the seeds. I know when these seeds grow, this is the kind of flowers they will remove. They will have these colors, they will have this shape. Some bloom in the morning, others bloom all day, others bloom for a season. I already know those details and I place them in strategic places. I know the ones that drop down, I'll place them in certain pots so that when they start dropping down, I can see the beauty of it. And that's how God is with us. When he is creating us, he has the end in mind. He has a pre-existing plan for our lives his pre-existing plan has all the details in place and that's why when we go back to the scriptures they are beautiful i mean the scriptures just show you how god had a plan from he already saw the end and then he began he created with the end in mind the same way i go to my flower garden and i know i want to see the ones on the wall here i want to see this i already have an end in mind then i start to put the pieces in place as i put the pieces in place i know there's some for the seedbed some will be seedlings some will be you know will be already grown plants depending on the kind of plant that we get so that is how god has planned for our lives we can go together in ephesians uh, chapter 2 verse 10 Ephesians 2.10 uh, I'll read, I'll start from the message version Now God, I'll start verse 7 Now God has us where he wants us With all the time in this world And the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus Saving is all his idea and all his work All we do is trust him enough to let him do it it's God give, God's gift from start to finish. It's God's gift from the start to finish. We don't play any major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does. This is the emphasis. The good work he has gotten ready for us to do what we had better be doing. Let me read it in a different version. Um, let me look at uh, Ephesians 2.10 in a different version. Give me a second. Ephesians 2.10. All that, that I was reading is just to show you the details of how God has already planned our lives and we cannot do it on our own. We have to depend on him. Let me put emphasis on verse 10. Uh, King James says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath ordained before, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It has already been determined. It has already been ordained what we should do, how we should live life. Amen. Let me read it in another version, easy English. It is God who has worked in us. He has made us what we are. He has made us what we are. He had already prepared good things for us to do. And he has joined us with Christ, with Christ Jesus, so that we can do those good things. That means there's already a plan that God has existing for us. All he needs for us to do is to join in with Christ and do the works that God has planned for us. There is a plan for your life. Your life is about the things that you need to do. Your life is about God's purpose for you. And it's already been ordained. It's already been done. It's already been planned for. Let me look at another version for we are God's masterpiece, that's beautiful, created in the Messiah Jesus to perform good actions that God prepared long ago to be our way of life. Can you imagine? Let me repeat that verse in the ISV version. For we are God's masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. 
connected back to uh, Psalms 139. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. He has taken time. He has put effort. He has put thought. We are a masterpiece. Each and every one of us in our differences, we are a masterpiece. We are created in the Messiah Jesus, Messiah Jesus to perform good actions. What are we created for? To perform good actions. Why? Those actions that we are to perform had already been prepared long ago to be our way of life. God created us to perform good actions and that is supposed to be our way of life. That's supposed to be the way we live our life. We live our life according to the way God had already predestined for it. Let me read a different version. It is God who has made us what we are now. Because of our relationship with Christ Jesus, he has enabled us to receive spiritual or eternal life in order that we should conduct our lives habitually, doing the good deeds that God previously planned for us to do. And that's what I was talking about. There is a pre-existing plan with God. Each of us has a plan that has been set out for us a pre-existing plan and we are supposed to conduct our lives habitually doing the deeds that God had already planned for us to do. So as you plan your life, this is what I want to encourage you. Plan your life and make sure that your life fits into God's pre-existing life for you because that's the whole reason why you are on earth, to fall into God's plan. God has a pre-existing plan for you and you need to fall into it. Amen. You need to fall into, find God's pre-existing plan for your life and fall into it because that's what we have been created for. Good works that we may habitually do them according to what God has planned for us. I mean, the word of God is amazing. It gives you, it shows you what is already there. You don't even need to reinvent the wheel of what should I do? How should I do? It's simple. God has already made a plan for you and that's what you're supposed to fall into. I know I keep repeating myself, but I am hoping that as I repeat this, it sinks down into your heart that there is a pre-existing plan by God for you to fall into. Let's look at Jeremiah 1.6 or we can even go a little higher. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. Before you are formed, I know this is a popular scripture, we all know it. Before you are formed in the body of your mother, I had knowledge of you. And before your birth, I made you holy. Oh my goodness, how good is that? Before your birth, I made you holy. Hallelujah. I have given you the work of being a prophet to the nations. God has already purposed for each of us to, to be a voice to the nations and um i know it's easy for someone to look at this scripture and say no i'm not a prophet i'm not called into the ministry whatever place you are in life whether you're a mother whether you're a student whether you're a father or whatever you are whatever role you play whether you're an accountant whatever professional role you play as you go into your vocation as you go to do that which you're doing daily god is saying i have called you as a voice to the nations you are god's voice wherever you are daily and he purposed and ordained for that way before you even came out of your mother's womb let me look at another version is the english i knew you even before i made your body inside your mother's body oh my goodness that is beautiful i knew you even before i made your body inside your mother's body isn't god amazing i chose you before you were born i decided that you must be a prophet to all the countries in the world that's what the lord said i decided god has already made his decision and remember god is not those kind of uh, is not the god who makes a decision today and changes his mind tomorrow no he has made a decision that you are a voice to your generation on his behalf remember we are created for good works god has already created you whatever you are doing today you're supposed to reflect god's will and purpose for your life amen let me read another version i knew you before i formed you in the womb i set you apart for me oh my goodness that is beautiful i set you apart for me today ask yourself whatever you are planning for your life is it for god because he has set you apart for him. He has set you apart for himself. Whatever you are doing, whatever plans you are having in your life, are they for him? 
Let me continue. I set you apart for me before you were born. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nation. Can you imagine? Not, it's, it's not even a democratic choice or um, a voting process or, you know, it's an appointment. He picks you out of the crowd. And I love the fact that you as a lady watching me today from appointed, anointed, accomplished woman, you are appointed, you are appointed by God to be a voice to the nations. Let me read the last version. I knew you before I finished forming you in your mother's womb, before you were born, I set you apart, I chose you, and I appointed you to be my prophet, whose messages will be for all the nations. Another version says, before I formed you in the womb, in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I sanctified you, hallelujah. And I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. God has already put out his pre-existing plan for you. He's already said it in his word. I mean, I've gone through all those versions so that you can hear it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing it again by the word of God. And this is what the Lord is saying. I have formed you. I have a pre-existing plan for your life. So whatever life plans you are making, ensure that your life plans are according to my plans for your life. Let me look at another version. Let's look at uh, Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for well-being and not for calamity, in order to give you a future and a hope. I mean, how better can I explain that? I know the plans that I have for you. So thank you for making your plans, but God has plans for you. I go back to the example that I was giving you for my flower garden and my vegetable garden. Those plants are planning to grow and give me beans and give me spinach and give me roses and give me carnations and all those beautiful plant, flowers and plants. However, I have a plan for those flowers. I know where they will be placed. I know which ones colors I need. I know how they will be potted and all those things. They plants have a plan to grow. However, I have a bigger plan for them. I already intended how they will be set up. And that's how God is. He already knows how you will be living your life, but you can continue with your plan, but ensure that your plans fall in plan with God. Because when they don't, you can easily be cut off. Let's look at another verse. I, Yahweh, know what I have planned for you. I'm planning to cause things to go well for you, not to cause you to experience disasters. I am planning to give you many things that you confidently expect to receive in the future. God is beautiful. I mean, he's already set out how our lives will be. He's already planned how we will live our lives. He has a plan for our future and he's amazing. And he keeps telling us what he, did, he will do for us. Let me look at Jerem, uh, the message version. This is what this is God's word on the subject. As soon as uh, let me skip uh, verse uh, ten. I'll show up and take you up. I'll show up and take care of you as I promise and bring you back home. I know what I am doing. I love that. I know what I am doing. God is telling you today. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you and not to abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. And how do we find that plan? How do we find God's pre-existing plan? Let's go down to the next verse, verse 12. It says, when you call on me, when you come and pray to me, I will listen. So I know someone is asking, okay, thank you. You've told us there's a pre-existing plan for the, from the Lord about our lives. But how do I know his pre-existing plan? God is giving, you it, giving it to you in verse 12. He's saying, when you call on me, when you come and pray to me, I will listen. When you come looking for me, you will find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. My goodness. What a scripture. I'll do it. I'll read that scripture again. And the question we are asking, 
how do I find God's pre-existing plan for my life? How do I know what God's expectations are for my life? You can only find something when you search for it. And God is giving to us in verse 12, he says, when you call on me, when you come and pray to me, I will listen. When you come looking for me, you will find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and you want it more than anything else, what is God saying? He will make sure you will not be disappointed. I mean, God's word is so nice. Uh, it's just beautiful. He says, you want it? You know, I have it. I'll give it to you. There's a way I'll give it to you. When you want it so badly, more than anything, I'll make sure you are not disappointed. I mean, I'll make sure your, your hopes are not dashed. And that means that we need to take care of our thoughts. It means we need to take care of what we meditate on. Because for us to know God's plan, that means we spend time in the Word. You know, there is a study that has been shown about people who spend time in the Word. Their memory is refreshed. They are at peace. They are at rest. Because there's a way the Word of God just refreshes you. The pressure levels are low. They are saying that people who spend time in the Word and genuinely enjoy God's presence. Sicknesses are reduced. Um, I was looking at a study some time back about people who are who have clocked a hundred years and above and most of them, if not all of them, kept talking about a relationship with God. A place where you and God have such tight intimacy of relationship and communication that there is nothing that can overwhelm you when you are with God. That's what I'm calling us back to. As we plan our lives, I want us to remember that God has taken so much time to just create us fearfully, wonderfully. He set us apart. He has, you know, he's made us with so much reverence and oh, and he looks at us and is thinking, wow, this is a masterpiece. This is what this creation is supposed to do fearfully and wonderfully and i want us to put that at the back of our minds if god has created us fearfully and wonderfully then what is our role our role is to fall into place in his pre-existing plan so today i want to encourage us i don't want you to give up on life i don't want you to be discouraged about anything in life because god has already set out his plan for you and he says in his plan for you you will not be disappointed you will not lose hope keep hoping and believing and trusting in him keep your faith in him i want to give you examples of people in the bible and we all know that even ourselves we go through so much sometimes but let me give you an example of paul i think it's in Acts 18 um if i'm not wrong verse 5 to 11 there but what happened to paul he already had a plan he was in corinth and his heart was sold out to the people, but there was a level of rejection. And, you know, he wanted to give up and he felt like, no, I need to move on. And while he was thinking that way, the Lord came back to him and said, no, there's much people in the city for me. Tarry, wait there. And Paul stayed in that town for a year and a half just waiting on God and just ministering to those same people that had rejected whatever he was saying. And today we are celebrating the church, the Corinthian church. We are celebrating the letters that were written to the Corinthian church because Paul did not give up. Sometimes when God has a plan for our lives, it can be difficult. It can be, it can get you to places where you feel like giving up. You feel like it's too much. If Paul went through that experience, then who are we? We will as well go through all those experiences. We will go through those moments when we feel like, Lord, I cannot take it anymore. But there's a plan and you need to stick to that plan. When Moses was up in the mountain and God gave him a blueprint of how it was supposed to be, how the tabernacle was supposed to be done. When you went back, God said, ensure that you stick to the blueprint that you saw in the, mount in the mountain. Meaning there is a plan that God has already put out and you're supposed to stick to it. When Moses came down, what he saw was totally different from what he was expecting. He was frustrated. I mean, it was, it was heart-wrenching for him. But he had to stick to the blueprint because God had already put an existing plan for him. If Moses had not followed God's blueprint, where would we be today? The scriptures, I mean, 
what will we will we will we be following? Fine, God has a way of you know, we would have sorted it, but his plan would have eventually been the plan that God had intended for. Let's think about someone like Noah. Noah was created and had to live that life, that the length of life that he lived, because God had a plan to save humanity. When God's mind uh, put it to Noah that Creator man gave him the dimensions, you know, divinely guided him on how he should do. And when all was done, guiding the animals two by two and guiding Noah and his family and ensuring that there was a generation that was preserved for his glory. What if Noah had not done it? Do you want to tell me it was easy for Noah? No, there was no rain before that. I mean, the experience was totally not there. There was nothing to relate to. But he had to follow God's plan. And what happened? When he followed God's plan, everything fell into place. And that applies to you. There are many times in life, as you go through life's journey, in marriage, in uh, school, in your ministry life, in your vocational life, in your business, in your career, whatever it is, in your investing, in your financial management, there gets a time when it's so discouraging, it's so overwhelming, and you feel like, I cannot take this anymore. God is reminding you today, you have to stick to the blueprints that he gave to you. That thing that you know deep down in my Noah, this is God. That is where God wants you to stick to. If you look at all the inventions that have been done in life, all of them can be attributed to a calling. That still small voice that someone says, I knew it. I was there meditating and I just felt I need to do this. I need to do this. And I mean, creation and ideas and inventions have come. When people listen to that still small voice, when they listen to that plan that God has already put in place and fall into his pre-existing plan. Let's look at someone like Ruth and Boaz. Tell me, if Ruth had not insisted to go with Naomi. If she had not insisted and said, your God shall be my God and your people shall be my people. The generation of Christ is from Ruth and Boaz, from Rahab the harlot. God doesn't mind who you are and your background. It's about falling into plan, his pre-existing plan. And that's where the victory is. And sometimes we will error in our plan, but as we error, God has a comeback plan. I'm reminded of David. Uh, when they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant from Obed Edom's house and the, um, I forget his name, that guy touched it and he was struck. And God is reminding us, do it according to my plan. I already know how I want my plans to be. So sometimes some of us have been struck, some of us have been affected, some of us have gone through tragedy and pain, not really because, I mean, it's because at some point, someone did not follow the plan, but God is calling us back. He's saying, I have a plan, a pre-existing plan and a beautiful plan, and I want you to fall into it. I want you to be encouraged that if Abraham did it, you can do it. Abraham, while he was going up with his son to sacrifice him, if he had not followed God's pre-existing plan, what if he had you know, gone up and decided, I'll just, I'll just sacrifice Isaac with the knife that I have without waiting for God. After all, this son, God has done this. He's given me and he's taking away. Let me just kill him immediately. If he was not listening to God's voice, where God said, no, don't touch that boy. There's a ram in the thicket. That ability to be able to listen to God and to hear his voice is what we are, God is, calling us to do. He knows that sometimes as humans there's a lot of noises and clatter and things distracting us, but God is calling us back to him. He's saying, follow my word, walk in my ways. You know, go back to Jeremiah 29 verse 12, where he's saying, call on me. I will hear you. I will listen to you. I will not disappoint you. I will be there and ensure you get the future that you are expecting. So may the Lord strengthen us. May the Lord encourage us to just walk and walk, do according to his plan and purpose. God's will for us is to do the great commission. 
the great commission is to make disciples and that's why i'm calling us you're fearfully and wonderfully made for a purpose when you have that item in your house it has a purpose there is nothing in life that has no plan and purpose everything that is around you has a plan and a purpose that you have planned for it and that's god's plan he has made you fearfully and wonderfully so that all those life plans that you're having for yourself can align to his pre-existing plan my call today is let's fall into god's pre-existing plans for us purpose in your heart that you must walk according to his calling purpose in his in your mind that you must accomplish god's purpose for your life in this generation that you'll put your gifts to work make sure all the gifts and the talents that god has placed in your heart that they will work for his glory make sure you achieve that which you have been called to do and my final word would be find the you that God made fearfully and wonderfully. Find the you that God made fearfully and wonderfully. Find the you that God made fearfully and wonderfully. Because the only way to find you is to find you in his word. I haven't opened the, my physical Bible, but find the you in here. Because God's plans are all here. This is literally a manual for you to fall into place, into God's pre-existing plan. So I'm so blessed and I'm so uh, charged up to let you know that if you can fa fall into God's plan for your life, everything will be easy. Even when the challenges come, even when you deviate and don't grow straight, he'll put you back together again. If, for example, I'm planting a tomato and for some reason it's overwhelmed, I'll come and string it up, I'll put it up back onto the trellis and it will grow again because that's what the you know i take care of it and that's what god will do for you when there is any deviation he'll put you back together so may the lord bless you and encourage you and strengthen you i thank you amen and amen i'd like to pray for us just as i wind up father in the name of jesus i want to thank you for all our viewers i want to thank you for all the people that get an opportunity to listen to this word i pray that you encourage them i pray that you, you strengthen them according to your word you say you have a plan for us may that beautiful plan that you have for us may you enable us because your word says you cause us to both to do and to will of your good pleasure may that be our strength that we'll be able to do and to will and to do of your good pleasure as we plan for our lives as we plan for our families as we plan for our careers and everything that we put in plan father may it fall according to your pre-existing plan may your name be glorified and magnified forever in jesus name the lord bless you Amen. all right welcome back uh right now we're going to take offering so um the details are going to be on the screen um, how you can give in Malawi, in Uganda, as well as other countries. So as you're giving, I'd like to make a few announcements. Uh, first of all, I'd like to inform you that from the 24th of this month to the 29th, we are going to have a week where Pastor, or let me say Reverend Toya Masiko, is going to be teaching on abuse. So it's going to be online on Facebook and WhatsApp, starting at 7 p.m. CAT, 8 p.m. EAT, every day uh, for those five days. I know that you're going to be blessed, so plan to be a part of it. And on the 30th of this month, we're going to have a time of prayer and fasting. We're going to be praying for families. We will also be led by Reverend Masiku, as well as our own mother, Pastor Jungo Twama. So please plan to be a part of these programs. We also have an eight-week mentoring program for young women. That's going to start on the 3rd of May. Um, if you're a young woman, please plan to be a part of it. It's going to be a holistic mentoring program covering topics from Christianity, serving, destiny, career and academics, as well as relationships. So uh, there's a small fee attached to it. If you're a student, you will, be, you will, you will pay five US dollars, uh, 5,000 Malawi Kwaja, 15,000 Ugandan shillings. But uh, for all others, it's going to be 10,000 Malawi Kwaja, 30,000 Ugandan shillings and 10 US dollars. I would also like to inform you that we have a radio program in Malawi on Channel for All Nations. It shows every Wednesday from 10.30 a.m. It's called My Appointed Time with Pastor Jun Rukwama. It's a very powerful program with powerful teachings. So you can always tune in if you're in Malawi. 
And I would also like to um, inform you about a girls program that we have. We are running a girls mentoring program in Malawi, targeting uh, girls in schools and universities, uh, secondary schools, and young women in general. So we are running girls camps, we are running life planning seminars in schools and activities of that nature. So if you'd like to be a part of the team, if you'd like to volunteer or give, uh, please feel free, to, feel free to do so. You can contact us on the details on the screen. Uh, we also have um, WhatsApp pages where we have um, morning devotions every day. We have teachings that are posted by Pastor June and uh, other activities that take place. We also have a Facebook group. So if you'd like to be a part of this, please also contact us on those uh, numbers on your screen and um, through our Facebook pages. So we are looking forward to having you be a part of this program. Thank you so much.
because of his love I'm not Hello everybody, greetings to all of God's gals. I am Tilina Olamba, I am a counseling psychologist, a university lecturer at the University of Malawi in the psychology department. I am an intern pastor with Word Alive Ministries International and just an all-round advocate for issues to do with mental health. So I am here today to share on an issue that is so dear to my heart, the issue of self-esteem and how it can affect every area of your life, how you make plans for your life, how you interact with other people, the way your career is going to be run or directed, all of those kinds of things can be impacted by issues of mental health. So I am so grateful that you are all going to take the time and we are going to look into God's word together and share about what the Lord is telling us regarding issues of self-esteem. So before I begin, allow me to just take this opportunity to thank appointed, anointed and accomplished woman for giving me this platform and this opportunity to talk to everybody out there who is tuned to this, to this particular seminar. Thank you so much to Pastor June all of the wonderful ladies who have been planning this event tirelessly. I pray that this will be an opportunity that God will speak to us all and really just give us a lesson on how we can conduct our lives as his children. With that being said, I believe the best place to start is to go into prayer. So we're going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that you have given us to share from your word and to get wisdom from you. I pray, dear Lord, that may you use me as a mouthpiece. Help me, Lord God, to convey your heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. We are going to be talking about the issue of self-esteem. What it is, what it isn't, um, how you know what the state of your self-esteem is and how it can affect your life. So, so the first question that I would ask anybody, and I'm sure other people are asking, is what exactly is self-esteem? Because it's one of those words that a lot of people share or a lot of people mention, but then we might not really know what it means. So self-esteem is your overall opinion of yourself essentially, um, or how you value yourself. You know, the word esteem means to value something or to put, um, put some kind of weight on something. So that is essentially what self-esteem is. It is the esteeming of yourself. How much do you value yourself? How highly do you think of yourself? Or um, how you feel about your own abilities, your own limitations. If you have a healthy self-esteem, essentially you do feel good about yourself. You might have one or two things here and there that um, might not be perfect, right? But all in all, you do feel good about yourself and you see yourself as a person who deserves respect. On the other hand, when you have low self-esteem, your behavior is also something that's going to reflect it. You put quite low value on your own thoughts, your own opinions. You might constantly worry that you just are not enough in one way or another. Not smart enough, not pretty enough, not rich enough not talented enough, all of these different areas can be um, things that you consider lacking in yourself if your self-esteem is, um, is low. So what I would like us to do right now is to just share a little bit about what some of the things are that can actually affect your self-esteem. A person who 
um, like any other person is born into a family or a community generally, you're surrounded by other people, your self-esteem starts getting shaped very, very early in your life. Even as a baby, you may not remember all of the experiences that you have as a baby, but there are some experiences that you go through in your life that start to shape your self-esteem from the time that you are very, very young. And there are different things that can contribute to um, whether you have a high self-esteem or a low self-esteem. And one of those things is your relationships. How do you interact with other people? How do you interact with your family members, with your friends? What kind of um, environment have you grown up in? And how has that affected how you see yourself? That is one thing that can influence your self-esteem. Some of the experiences that you've had at home, at school, or in the community, whether these are good experiences or bad, those can also affect your self-esteem or how you view yourself. I know a lot of people have gone through some very painful life experiences. Um, some women might have gone through horrible ordeals like sexual assault or physical assault, maybe verbal assault really, because words can actually be very painful as well and can be a form of assault. So maybe you've had very bad things said to you from a very young age. Those kinds of things can really just sink into your mind and you start to um, believe them and you start to take them in and you start to accept that this is really what I am or who I am. You know, words like you're stupid, you're useless, you're ugly, you're never going to become anything. You know, those kinds of words are abusive words. And the more they get said to you, they can actually influence your self-esteem for the worse. Other things that can affect your self-esteem include media messages. Right now, social media is such a big thing. Almost anybody is on social media. Everybody who is watching this particular seminar has access to some kind of social media. Social media is a very huge part of many messages that people are taking in every single day that can shape their self-esteem either for better or for worse. We are going to talk about that a little bit more even as we're going on. Um, your thoughts and your perceptions, that is something else that can affect your self-esteem. The kind of thoughts that you allow to keep circulating in your mind, um, the kind of perceptions that you have, how you view the world, how you view yourself, all of those things can affect um, your self-esteem. We also cannot overlook physical issues like your appearance, whether you might have a disability, whether you are um, tall or short or light or dark skinned or whatever it is that the standard of beauty in your community is. If you can look at that standard and compare it to yourself and you see that you're not fitting to that standard, it can affect your self-esteem. That does go hand in hand with the messages that you receive from media. Other issues such as whether you have a disability, whether you have suffered an injury that affects your own physical capabilities, all of those things can also contribute to your self-esteem. Social issues, financial issues, whether you are um, financially stable, or not is also going to affect your self-esteem. You might have a very low opinion of yourself if financially you just are not able to have all of the things that you need or you are not able to um, achieve all of the things that you need to achieve because you are lacking in your finances. That can really take a huge blow on your self-esteem. Now, there is one thing that I would like us to discuss, which is the issue of humility and low self-esteem. Christianity puts a lot of emphasis on humility and every Christian is encouraged to emulate Jesus Christ who is our ultimate role model and he was the most humble in the way he lived his life and the way he gave up his life for the sake of our own salvation. Now when we look at his life, I'm sure we can say that he was humble but I don't think any of us can say that he had a low self-esteem. You see, low self-esteem and humility 
are two very different things. Somebody who has a low self-esteem is somebody who does not view themselves in a positive light or they do not appreciate the, the good things about themselves. On the other hand, somebody who is humble is a person who does not consider themselves better than everybody. That is essentially what humility is. You view yourself as being no better than anybody else. You are at the same level, particularly if you look at your value in the eyes of God. You do not consider yourself to be any more special, um, any more important than anybody else because we are all human beings. All of us created in the image of God. All of us equally important. Jesus died for you just as much as he died for me. So that is a view of humility. Somebody who has a low self-esteem, on the other hand, is somebody who views everybody else as more important, more deserving. Um, you know, they view themselves as being the least of the least, not deserving of any kind of attention. So low self-esteem is really just an inability to feel good about yourself. And it is characterized by feeling inadequate, feeling worthless, or feeling as if you're not competent. I hope that has at least clarified the difference between a low self-esteem and humility. In that same line, I would also like to clarify the difference between a high self-esteem and pride. Because these two also kind of conflict with each other, especially when we don't have a clear understanding of them. When you are proud, you view yourself as better than everybody else. Nobody can compete with you. There is nobody that actually deserves any respect more than you. That is essentially what pride is. It is described as a sin in the Bible because it goes against what God says about every human being. When you are prideful, now get this, when you are prideful, it is actually a sign of low self-esteem. How does that happen? If you are prideful, deep down at the bottom of your heart, you might have thoughts that you are not good enough, you are not um, important enough, you are worthless. And so you try to overcompensate or you try to oppose those kinds of thoughts by forcing yourself to always act like you are the most important person in the room by never considering anybody else's thoughts or anybody else's opinions. Every time you have that kind of proudful, prideful outlook, you are essentially displaying that underneath all that pride, there is a root of low self-esteem. A high self-esteem, or what I would describe as a healthy self-esteem, is where you appreciate who you are, you know that you have value, and at the same time, you don't try to use that to take advantage of other people or to lord it over everybody else. So those are the differences between a healthy self-esteem and pride and a low self-esteem and humility. A person with a healthy self-esteem is actually somebody who is very humble. Those two things do go hand in hand. Now, I would like us to just consider some examples from the Bible of women and how they manifested their, their, their self-esteem, whether for the better or for the worse. I do have some examples of women that I'd like to quickly um, discuss. We have Mary of Nazareth, otherwise known as Mary, the mother of Jesus. I truly believe that she is one of the people who manifested a healthy self-esteem. Why do I say that? When the angel Gabriel came to tell her that she is going to bear the Son of God, she was able to be humble enough and to show her loyalty to God and accept to be used in that manner. This shows that she had a relationship with God. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine anybody who doesn't have a relationship with God receiving an angel being told a message that you're going to bear the Son of God, and that person just says, all right, let it be unto me as you have said. That's impossible. If you don't have a relationship with God, 
it is absolutely impossible that you would say that. That's why I actually do conclude that Mary had a very good relationship with God and she was God-fearing. She was obedient and she also lived her life in a way that showed that um, her life and her purpose is actually based and rooted in God. Another example is Hannah in 1 Samuel. Now, Hannah comes onto the scene as a victim of bullying because that is exactly what was going on with Hannah. Her co-wife, Penina, or Penina, depending on which side of the globe you're on, her co-wife used to constantly harass and tease her and mock her because she didn't have children, and Penina did. And it got to a point that Hannah's self-esteem was so low she used to cry all the time. She was sad all the time. She would go to the temple with her husband and wouldn't even have any appetite to eat. I actually believe Hannah might have been depressed just looking at those few verses that describe how her day-to-day -day life was. But Hannah did something very different that turned around her self-esteem. She turned to God. She was prayerful. She prayed to God and she asked God to help her resolve the root of this issue that is constantly coming back over and over again. And we know the end of it. She was able to give birth and not only to Samuel, who is perhaps the most famous of her children, but she did have other children after that. Now, keep in mind, it wasn't the children that raised her self-esteem. It was the fact that she prayed to God and God answered her. That was the thing that elevated her self-esteem. And we cannot talk about self-esteem without talking about Queen Esther. I really think this one is one of the best manifestations of somebody who has a high self-esteem, yet at the same time is humble. Queen Esther um, came from humble beginnings. She was an orphan. She grew up with her cousin in exile. I don't think there is any other combination that could have been worse or um, a, a different, a, a worse kind of humility from her beginnings. But she was selected among so many other beautiful women in that kingdom to be the wife of the king. And she did not forget where she came from. Her humility remained intact, but she was able to stand up and speak up for her people when the time required it. So those are all examples of people who manifested a high or a healthy self-esteem, even though they might have gone through life's challenges. Now, the reason why self-esteem is such an important issue to talk about is that issues of self-esteem affect every area of your life. They affect the kind of relationships you have. When you have friends, you either have good friends who build you up, who encourage you and support you, or you have the kind of friends who are toxic, they tear you down, they never support you, and they always want to one-up you. Depending on your level of self-esteem, you can actually dictate which kind of friends you want to have in your life and which ones you don't, because at the end of the day, that is completely in your hands. If you have a low self-esteem, you're not very able to maintain healthy boundaries. You could allow people to walk all over you, to mistreat you, to be toxic towards you, and you are tolerating and putting up with it. A person with a healthy self-esteem is able to put up a boundary and say, this is not going to happen to me anymore. You will not talk to me like that. You will not treat me like that. And let some toxic people go from their lives. Another area that really affects self-esteem is the issue of academics and career. So many young women have suffered from a low self-esteem and have allowed a low self-esteem to negatively impact their academics. I'll give you an example that comes from my own life. I have always been very vocal about the fact that I'm not good at mathematics. I don't, I don't hide it at all. In fact, I tell my students at the university, and they find it very shocking to think somebody who is now teaching them at university level failed mathematics at all levels. It's a fact. But 
that thing really, really negatively affected me for a long time. The fact that I was not good at mathematics, I felt stupid. I felt like there's nothing that I can do right. Now that's the thing about self-esteem too. When it's low, you start making all of these generalized statements about every area of your life. So I fail mathematics and I come up with this conclusion that I am stupid and incapable in all areas, which was a lie. And I thank God that that lie was really revealed to me and that God helped me to shake that off. But I'm talking about how low self-esteem or just your self-esteem in general can affect your career or it can affect your academics. Depending on your level of self-esteem, if you meet a challenge academically, if you don't pass as well as you wanted to in a particular subject, if you meet a challenge in your career, you don't get a certain job or you don't get a certain promotion, your self-esteem is going to be the thing that will dictate whether you're going to pick yourself up and try, try again, try harder, find new solutions, or curl up somewhere, cry your eyes out, and decide to give up. Those are both plausible options. You can choose to do either one, but your self-esteem is the thing that's going to direct which choice you're going to make. Your self-esteem is also going to affect your motivation. How motivated are you to work at something, to put in effort? How motivated are you to reach out to other people, to form connections, to form networks in the particular thing you want to do? Your self-esteem also affects how you minister. People who minister are also very much affected by issues of self-esteem. Pastors, prophets, bishops, any kind of ministry, any person who is actually working for the Lord in one way or another is a very ripe target for the devil to bring down their self-esteem. The devil is very good at trying to distract your thoughts and make you think about your own personal weaknesses and all of the reasons why you are not good enough to serve God, you are not good enough to do this work. So your self-esteem and how much work you're going to do for the Lord, those two things are very closely connected. Every time you have a chance to think about your own life and whether you are um, a suitable person to serve in the kingdom of God, the devil will come in with statements about your past, right? about your weaknesses, about the things that you're not capable of doing, about all the other people who can do it better than you. He will just fill your mind with all of that negativity so that you get to the point where you just give up and sit down and you tell yourself, I don't think I can do this. Think of Moses. Moses had a moment of low self-esteem when God called him and said, I have chosen you to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Moses said, oh, but you know, I can't go. I'm not the right person for that because I have this stutter. I don't know how to speak in public, right? Every time that I look at um, a passage in the Bible where God is going to a person and telling them that I have chosen you for a particular work, I would say 99% of the time, the person had something to say about it. Oh, but why me? How am I the right person for this? No, I don't think I am the right person for this. No, God, I think you're making a mistake, you know, in one way or another. And that is clearly an example of how your self-esteem can affect how you are going to serve the Lord. Now, having talked about all of these different ways in which your self-esteem can affect your ministry, it can affect your work, it can affect your life. What are we supposed to do about it? The answer is to go into the Word of God. The Word of God is alive. The Word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. It does things that psychology books or blogs or self-help books cannot do. Those are words that are written by human beings under no inspiration, granted under a lot of education, but the Word of God is different. I love the Word of God because it is alive. It is, an, it is 
a living element that you can use when you are reading the word of God and when you notice the things that God says about you in his word, it is absolutely impossible for you to remain the same. God is the one who tells you who you are as you grow in him. The most important thing is to have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Give your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. When he comes into your life, he starts making all things that were stale and bad and worthless into new things. The Bible says in Romans that the old things have passed away. Behold, the new has come. Anything that was in your past that might have been dragging you down, all of those things go away. You could have been a hoe. In the eyes of God, as long as you confess and you ask for forgiveness, he's going to put that far away. You can ask Rahab. She was a prostitute, all right? And as soon as she turned around and she showed her faith, she was saved and she was part of the legacy of Jesus Christ. Her life turned around completely. So don't let your past be something that keeps you back from giving your life to God or allowing God to change you. Once you have established a relationship with, with God through Jesus Christ, read his word. God's word is the number one way that he's going to speak to you. Yes, God shows people visions and dreams. Sometimes people will have um, experiences where they hear the audible voice of God. But his word is one of the best ways that he can ever talk to you. If you want to know what God is saying to you, read the Bible. It's in there. Any verse that talks about anything good, don't think God is talking to anybody else. He is talking to you. Take that thing as a personal statement. Like God wrote this specifically for me. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He's talking about you. He's not talking about anybody else at that point, but you. Don't try and push those verses off to other people. It's not your looks that establish how fearfully or wonderfully you're made. The word of God says you are fearfully and wonderfully made because you were created in his image. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That word is talking about you. So every time you read his word, allow his word to change how you view yourself. Speak the word of God. Don't just read it and then keep it in your mind. Speak it out loud. Look at yourself in the mirror and say the words that you read in the Bible. Tell yourself, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are the apple of God's eye. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Google any verse that you want that talks about self-esteem and you will find it. You can stick those things on your mirror. You can look at different ways that you can actually continually soak your whole spirit with those words so that it becomes a part of your new identity. The word of God is going to shape you. Allow the word of God to shape you. You know, the devil's weapons are constantly coming at you. He's lying to you so many times. You're not good enough. Look at that person. They look so nice and you're not pretty like they are. Look at that person. They're going out on holidays abroad and you're not because you're broke. You're not this. You're not that. All the time, these things coming. He's always forming attacks you can also form a counter attack and that is through the word of god the word of god is our weapon it's not carnal by that i mean it's not a physical weapon it's not a gun it's not a sword but the bible says it is powerful for the pulling down of strongholds a stronghold is something that is so established that it's difficult to shake or it's difficult to get rid of like low self-esteem Low self-esteem is a stronghold. But the word of God is a weapon that is powerful enough to pull that down and then allow the word of God to help you rebuild and establish a healthy self-esteem. This is something that I am just so excited about talking about. Anytime that you want to share more about it or talk more about it, do reach out. I look forward to receiving your questions on this issue. And I look forward to continuing in this growth 
as we continue to uh, be established in the Lord together and learn more about ourselves as we learn more about our Lord. Thank you so much for your time. Be blessed.